This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast for episode 83 is John Ryan Huell in Brookline, Massachusetts. He graduated from the University of Detroit in 1963 with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. A series of mystical experiences during his college years led him to enter a religious order after graduation, but he left after five years in response to persistent messages appearing in his dreams. He taught high school mathematics and chemistry and worked as a research editor for the Encyclopedia Britannica in Chicago before entering the graduate program at Temple University, where he earned his Ph.D. in Religious Studies in 1973. Dr. Huell was an assistant professor of religion and culture at Northeastern University in Boston from 1973 to 1976, before leaving to train as a Jungian analyst in Zurich, Switzerland. He returned to Boston in 1980 to establish the analytic practice which continues today. He has been president of the New England Society of Jungian Analysts, president of the C.G. Jung Institute Boston, and convener of the American Council of Jungian Analysts, as well as a member of the Executive Committee of the International Association for Analytical Psychology, based in Zurich. He is the author of eight books, The Love Cure, Therapy, Erotic, and Sexual, Perils of the Soul, Ancient Wisdom and the New Age, The Ecstasies of St. Francis, The Way of Lady Poverty, Divine Madness, Archetypes of Romantic Love, Jung in the 21st Century, Volume 1, Evolution and Archetype, and Volume 2, Synchronicity and Science, and Tantra and Erotic Trance, Volume 1, Outer Work, and Volume 2, Inner Work. His essay, Jung Comes Back to Himself, Reflections on the Connections Between the Red Book and Gnosticism was published in Volume 4 of Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. The theme of his professional work has been the generally overlooked spiritual and emotional dimensions of everyday life. In this episode, the second in a series, we focus on Dr. Huell's book Perils of the Soul, which applies this theme to the region of popular culture that has been called the New Age. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, March 24th, 2021, through the magic of Skype. Thanks so much for returning today, Dr. Huell. Happy to be here. So today we're going to focus on your book, Perils of the Soul, Ancient Wisdom and the New Age. It was published in 1999. So I would imagine that some of it, not all of it, uh, you might have addition to, possibly feel differently about. So I would like to begin with Jung. And I recently heard you say that Jung found that it was psychiatry, because Jung was trained as a psychiatrist, that psychiatry was the world in which one would develop a science of the soul. Would you say a little bit more about that? Well, psychiatry is supposed to be a science. We may not agree that it is. You can be trained as a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And in your training will have uh, some relationship to the um, the the scientific or her scientific perspective on the world. Uh, So what I'm thinking is, Jung had been working in his own mind on this on this realm of uh, experience. In fact, uh, before he began as a university student, he was already following what was going on in in the psychology of his day, um, much of it run by psychiatrists, Mm -hmm. and uh, he called it the French school. And it was the first uh, perspective, first group of people uh, who were intent on studying altered states of consciousness. Because they discovered that uh, in the first place, cases of hysteria and related forms were revealing a psyche that had a structure 
that uh, none of their uh, previous psychiatric efforts had found. Mm -hmm. And so there were suddenly for the first time, there were things you could do with a patient that made sense uh, rather than simply Put, putting them in institutions right. and um, making trying to make their lives safe, um, but not really making much of an effort to understand them. Mm -hmm. So Jung came of age, you might say, at a time when what he called the French school was very active. And uh, he called it the French school um, be, he, because he, many of the books he was reading came from Paris. Um, but also London and Boston uh, were also places where work was being done in the so-called French school. It had to do with the study of what can be done with a psyche if certain suggestions are given to it and uh, certain memories collected. So in a certain sense, we can say that perils of the soul is an attempt to uh, carry out some of that work a hundred years later. Um, that's us. We're, uh, uh, no, that's us. We're a hundred years later. That's, that's us in the, uh, in the late 20th century, whereas the, the French school began in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. The thing that, that interested me about the book was I sort of came of age during the new age, the, the height of, the new age movement. Uh, I was in college and then even after college. And this was all before I found Jung. And before I entered into analysis, I would hang out in new age bookstores. And it was interesting that some of the books you reference in this book, like John Mack's book, Abductions, and Barbara Marciniak's Bringers of the Dawn, I read back then. So then to find you today, a Jungian analyst, referencing those books was so interesting to me. So I think that the, what I found to be the premise of this book is that all of these concepts that stirred back up during this new age were really rooted in ancient times, in ancient wisdom, and nothing really new. So I'd like to for you to you know, go over that with us and and share your thoughts. But the first chapter is titled Mysticism and Bunk in the New Age. That is very important to sort of discern where is the dividing line between mysticism and bunk. Yes, but Mysticism and Bunk was my name for the book. And uh, the uh, publisher didn't like it. And he couldn't make up his mind, and eventually he said he was going to go without giving the book a title. I told him that that was not possible. We had to have a title, and I would come up with one if he wanted if he wanted me to. And he said, "Yeah, give me a try, give it a try." And so, at the time, having soul in the title was a draw. Everybody was selling books that had soul in the title, and. If you read beyond, well beyond the first few uh, chapters in the book, you find that there are people that have really gotten into trouble in the New Age. I call them New Age pioneers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people were uh, had a kind of romantic notion of what the New Age was. It, it opened them to uh, experimenting with uh, altered states of consciousness, uh, uh, a... a uh, Active imagination, for example, from a Jungian perspective, would certainly be a kind of new age uh, effort in that in that way of going about it. But some people had experiences imposed upon them. And uh, one of the scariest of those books, I guess, was the one uh, um, that you just mentioned. Was it um, Abduction? Um, yeah, Abduction, yes. And I, I, I was given the book by uh, an analyzand of mine at the time because she bought the book uh, with the idea that she'd learned something about that was really important. And uh, it's the book scared her so much that it gave her ideas that maybe she was being abducted. Mm -hmm. And so she said the book was too dangerous for her to read and uh, and gave me the copy. And uh but I didn't. She didn't know that I was thinking about writing a book on uh, uh, the New Age at that time. 
uh, actually, um, the, the idea of doing the book was given to me by my, my agent. I had, uh, I had an agent, uh, very capital letters, um, a woman who had wanted to be a literary agent. Mm-hmm. I was her first subject, her first client. And uh, she said that she thought I would do very well writing a book on the New Age. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to go there. But uh, she kept pushing, and I said, okay, send me a list of books you think I should read if I'm going to write a book on the New Age. And so she, she sent me the titles of a, a number of books, and I found them, found some of them. Uh, I even gave two of them to my uh, high school-aged son and uh, asked him what he, to give me an, an opinion what he thought of them. I don't know much, how much he read in them, but he had nothing but scorn and, but was a uh, hilarious uh, un- reading of the of the books that I'd given him. And but in the meantime, <clears throat> I began to I, I began to read some of that material. And I said, oh, I know what this is. Mm-hmm. This is Gnosticism. Mm. This is every now and then uh, the world uh, gets very close to what was called Gnosticism um, 2000 years ago. <clears throat> Most people think that Gnosticism is a Christian heresy, but it isn't a Christian heresy. It, it existed 300 years before Christ was born. Uh, so it's a, ten, it's a natural tendency, I would say, of the human mind to look for ultimate things. And the, the basic understanding would be if you had a, an experience of Gnosis, it would be as though you found a new dimension of your brain, which seems to be more important than the other ones and gives you deep insights into uh, what, it, what it is to be a human being. And uh, how, how do you find your, the essence of your being and things like that? Um, so that was where it was coming from. And I realized once I turned, once I realized I was dealing with Gnosticism, then everything in the New Age made a great deal of sense to me. There's a chapter about maybe two thirds of the way through the book in which I uh, give you, give the reader a, uh, a sort of liturgical looking or a, a account of the world from the Gnostic perspective, <clears throat> using all of the material that I had been discussing in the in, in the book up to that point, and I I think it's really an extreme. I'm delighted with that uh, reference that I have con- constructed there. It's about three pages long, and uh, it sort of summarizes all the material coming from all of the different uh, uh, experiencers in the New Age and um, puts them together and uh, puts it together as a sort of problem that a person has to deal with if one is taking the Gnostic view. And that is, in the first place, it means taking your unconscious very seriously. Mm. Jung was very fond of the Gnostics, of the ancient Gnostics. Um, And uh, the thing that he liked the most about them is that they believed their dreams. They took paid attention to them and believed there was importance in them. They wouldn't take a a very naive approach to their dreams, but they would take uh, an approach to their dreams, which was an effort to get to know their own uh, themselves at a deep level. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that's what's going on in the New Age. And the New Age leads us to perils of the soul if you get so involved that uh, you begin to think that these experiences I'm having scare the heck out of me, but I think I better stay here because there's some element of truth in them that I need to know. Some of the uh, people who had been abducted, abducted thought that what they were discovering was that they were, in some sense themselves, already aliens. And, uh, and so the aliens were getting in touch with them because they had a plan for organizing the cosmos um, there would usually usually there would be uh, uh, people who who were aware of uh, dark destructive uh, groups of aliens and others who were <clears throat> trying to teach us all teach us humans 
that we better get our act in order, that we're destroying the earth, um, that we need to come to a better understanding of one another and be open to meeting these aliens from other uh, planets that are interested in what's going on on earth. Firstly, I'd like to ask you, which chapter were you referring to? You said it was about two-thirds into the book. It begins on page 137, and uh, I don't know what chapter that is. Just a minute, I'll tell you what chapter that is. Chapter 6, The Cosmos, Universe, or Multiverse. So it begins there, and it goes, well, no further than page 140, from 137 to 140. In Chapter 6, The Cosmos, Universe, or Multiverse. Right. And I thought maybe we would get to this later, but we're talking about it now, alien abduction. So just for reference, the book by the late Harvard psychiatrist, John Mack, is titled Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. I'll provide a link to that and others in the show notes. And just as an aside, uh, the long-awaited biography of Dr. John Mack was just released last week. It was written by Ralph Blumenthal, who used to be with the New York Times. He's now a freelancer. It is titled The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. Again, I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. So I was hoping that we would talk about alien abduction because that is a very big interest of mine. And you mentioned something along with that, that some of the experiencers that either you encountered or that you came across also mentioned their uh, realization of the destruction of the environment. And I mentioned this because it is near and dear to my heart because that sort of happened to me. I'm not sure how it happened. I'm still exploring that. I don't have, I don't recall being abducted by aliens. I would not rule that out. Uh, But there came a point in my life, probably while I was in college. So that was in the 1980s. Yes, folks, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in 1988. And I was getting these, having these dreams and getting these downloads about, and this was long before uh, it was so popular to, you know, recycle and, and climate change in the news. I was getting that information. I was, had become so sensitive to that, um, to what we were doing to the environment and the importance of taking care of the environment and recycling was like this big thing to me. So anyway, I could go on and on, but I shouldn't. And I'd like for you to explain in greater detail from the view of a Jungian, what you think is happening here. I mean, we can't rule out that these people are really being taken by some otherworldly beings um, and given this information what I'm going to let, let you speak now well John Mack maybe I should start with him <clears throat> one of the things that was most impressive about him was in sincerity um, I was told that he lived only about two blocks from me oh. uh, but uh, I never had occasion to try to uh, search him out <clears throat> Um, I think the reason that his book was so uh, um, inf- inform- so uh, meaningful to people mm-hmm. was based on his honesty, his desire not to draw conclusions for which he did not have enough evidence. And so he was very careful. Some of the people that he worked with were... Uh, enjoying the uh, the aliens, but even even those who most enjoy the aliens also felt they were in touch with something that was much bigger than they were, and they had no idea how to deal with it. Uh, they were happy if, if the aliens were uh, friendly with them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what I would say is that something was going on at that particular time 
uh, touched off by reports that uh, in the um, in the news media that do arise to the come rise to the future every now and then. One of the things I discovered about people who tried to study the New Age is that uh, they would locate the beginning of the New Age further and further in the past. Mm. Uh, and I think what it is, is this is a natural human phenomenon. Uh, these days, um, because we don't have spirits hiding any place on Earth any longer, um, we have, they have to come from somewhere else, and the only place we can think of, and the only thing that our science is uh, sufficient to uh, explore would be the world outside this planet, mm -hmm. in, uh, in other planets or other places in the solar system, in the, uh, in the universe, and the cosmos. Um, so what he was, so I mean, we could, I would think that, uh, first of all, we, we, it would be wrong to, um, diagnose, um, or to take too, uh, literally the stories of the, uh, the people who are abducted or claim to be abducted. Well, what's important about it is they are having an experience that they cannot deny. What, this is something that's going on within the human psyche with, uh, and it's, it afflicts some people who seem to be more sensitive to it than others. But probably it's always been the case that humans and some, and one sector of the humans especially, are capable of imagining other beings that are more advanced than we are and have an idea of where we should go. They begin to sound like they belong to the group called the Gnostics. That is to say, I have experienced something. Gnosis is a, a deep realization. It's a, it's a way of knowing that it is emotional and uh, cosmic in its, uh, in its effects. And so these people are, in, are having experiences that are unlike the, the experiences of people around them. And these experiences seem to be drawing them toward a deeper understanding of their own being. And this, ultimately, is what Jung is about. Yeah. Jung is trying to get us to look into our collective unconscious and find out who we are at a much more basic level than we, uh, than we would learn uh, from... Um, <clears throat> you know, from the books that contain the information, you might say, the, the, the studied and uh, scientifically proven uh, understandings. These are emotional understandings that these people are having, and the emotional understandings are, tr are trying to say to them, there's something else that's being missed by most of the people around here, and it's really crucial that somebody get it. And, and so, and there really is truth, of course, in the idea that we are destroying the planet through our global warming. And uh, we really need to be brought up against it. Yeah, we, we have to deal with the um, present pandemic that's going on. And it's, it's, it's crucial. It's right at the forefront. But we can't forget what, we've been, what we're doing to the planet because we haven't got much time left. Mm -hmm. If we pay attention to the people who really are studying the science of our planet's warming. And so this, it has, I would say, the, our planet's warming has uh, in, brought some people to the edge of discovering a bigger understanding. A bigger understanding that maybe scares the heck out of them because maybe it's suggesting that there's something in what they've understood up till now um, that the that's scary that's that's going to be this making some sort of demand they don't feel that they may be up up to up for you say that jung was interested in every manifestation of the psyche and going back to what i was saying in the beginning about myself and how i was very caught up in the new age movement before i found jung what what made me interested in jung and kept me all these years it, with Jung is that it is just that, that he was interested in every manifestation of the psyche. Uh, he didn't pathologize 
these things. He was interested in the deeper levels of the psyche. And you say he was trying to come up with a comprehensive view of the psyche. So it, I keep saying the psyche, the psyche, the psyche, it's the psyche. It all comes back to that. And it, it also leads me to another question that Jung looked at. What is consciousness? Okay. I, what I'd like to say here is just- and say is that you know Jung wrote a book on UFOs mm-hmm. and uh, he didn't take a stand on them he thought it was very important that we not make an early judgment mm-hmm. but what he thought was going on is based on the shapes of the vehicles they weren't the aliens there were no reports at the time that Jung was alive and the uh, he died in 1961, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, aliens w- were flying in spaceships and, and coming to, to our planet. Um, that's something that we needed to have more technology to, to begin to have that fantasy. But the thing that got Jung uh, interested was they, the uh, vessels that they came in were mostly round or saucer-shaped or uh, cigar-shaped. Mm-hmm. And he, t- he talked about the fact that these are, uh, if you think of, of the, sh- uh, the shapes of what they're imagining, if they're imagining it, the, the, of what they're experiencing. If you take the shapes, you can see that what is being represented here is what I call, uh, Jung talking now, what I call, what Jung calls the, the, the self. We are so much lost from knowing who we are that we're beginning to project into the sky around us images of ourself. And the men, and they're, we're fascinated by that and scared to death by that. And it's appropriate that we be scared to death um, with a direct uh, encounter with our own self because it'll have more in it than we've ever thought possible. And we won't be, we won't be ready to assent to some of the things that we will do, uh, that are there in our unconscious to be encountered. So it is a peril of the soul for any of us to venture in there. That's what I meant to imply by the, the title of the book. It's, it's, it, life presents itself to some people much more dramatically than to others, and they may or may not be closer to uh, what we might call reality with a capital R, but they certainly need to be listened to. Mm-hmm. Something's going on. When we sp- we suddenly spend a decade um, worrying about uh, aliens and whether they're coming to uh, get us or to inter- intermarry with us or um, interbreed, interbreed, yeah, yeah. There's a one of my favorite examples from um, Mercia Eliade's shamanism book, mm-hmm. a big uh, overview of shamanism around the world. He uh, he has an interview with a, a shaman uh, from Siberia, and the, and the shaman says he has two wives, the fleshly wife with which, whom he has children that he knows in, in daylight, and a, uh, and a spirit woman only half as tall as his, uh, as his fleshly woman. Um, and uh, this woman is teaching him because his tribe has forgotten its shamanic past. She's teaching him how to be a shaman because the tribe needs a shaman uh, for guidance and for uh, physical healings and spiritual uh, issues and so forth. And he said uh, he sle- he spends the night with her in his dreams, and she is like a uh, a, a um, she's like a wife also. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, with her, he doesn't have any children. She has given him um, spirits who will help him do the work that he needs to do as a shaman. So I thought that was extremely interesting. I, yeah. there's, I think there's some reference to it in uh, Perils of the Soul. Mm-hmm. Um, extremely interesting because this is a guy who's having experiences that, we, that look very much like the experiences we are having, but he comes from a from a culture that is almost unimaginable for us. In Siberia. In Siberia, yes. So what do you, as a Jungian, say to that? that What what is happening there? 
one of the criticisms that I encounter from the people I know in the UFO community, when they hear the name Jung, they dismiss Jung because they think that he said that this is all projection. So they feel they feel like they're not being validated and they're not being taken seriously because they believe Jung thought it was all in their mind. It was all, it was all a projection that it wasn't quote unquote real. Jung did not say that in his book on, uh, um, UFOs, however, he thought, he thought it was very important to keep an open mind about this. We are not in a position now to say, this or that is the ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. We are only being presented with images that have meaning for us, and we ought to find out what their meaning for us is, at least. So, but I, I know what you, the reaction you have, I also had, I, I had some training with Michael Harner in shamanism. And uh, I, if I opened my mouth uh, and said anything that suggested that I was a Jungian analyst or anything like that, I was immediately attacked by the others uh, because their projection was that Jung thinks that spirits don't exist. And we know that spirits exist because we interact with them all the time. And uh, Jung would have no problem with their interacting with them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he would say, I'm interested in in it from a psychological perspective, uh, which is not to deny that it's real. It is real. Mm -hmm. it's, it's at least real psychic experiences that are happening for a real reason. And they belong to, they need to be understood. And they, they belong on our, men, on our menu of things to learn about ourselves. Hmm. So the projection is real, but that does not discount the physical material reality of what could be interacting with us. Would you say that? I, I think I could say that, yeah. Um, and we, don't know, we don't know exactly. Are these people all comprised of the same kind of matter that we're comprised of? Mm. I mean, I think that's not, I don't know if anybody has answered that question um, successfully. Mm -hmm. We don't know. All we know is that people are having experiences, and the experiences are very important. I want to go back to something I was uh, starting to explain earlier, which is these aliens or these visitors, as Whitley Strieber calls them. And by the way, he's going to be my guest next week on a special quarantine edition. He calls them the visitors, mm -hmm. these beings as quote unquote other. So in Jungian psychology, we read a lot about the other. And I want to mention this because it's been on my mind, the topic of racism in, in our society here in the United States, I'm sure globally, but I can only speak about what I've been experiencing and seeing here, especially last year when the Black Lives Matter movement started. I was recording an episode with uh, my friend who is an African American gentleman, uh, a photographer in Florida. Anyway, so we were talking about racism because I naively said I just was shocked to know that it still existed to the extent that it does today in the United States. I was born and raised in the New York City area and lived outside of Washington, DC. I've always lived in very diverse neighborhoods and as I do today. So I was talking to a friend, it's like we weren't taught to be racist. So my wondering is with it being at the forefront in the media today, this issue of racism and and confronting it. And also what is in the forefront of the media today is UFOs and government involvement. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if the two are related because how are we going to, and so many people think, yes, they want the aliens to show up, please. But the truth is that we're still having issues dealing with each other here on earth, the different races and the racism that still exists today in all of us. I think though, that this, this, the UFOs can be uh, the beginning of a solution of our racism. Mm. Because the, we, what we will see is that we are really the same 
gene of the same uh, species, we humans on Earth. These people coming from another planet are not our brothers and sisters the way other people here on Earth. And so the, uh, the beginning, the colors of our skin, I would argue, will be less important uh, to us uh, when we know that there's another species very much like us uh, but that is com also cl completely different. Mm -hmm. That we, we, I guess they should hurry up if uh, you know if we're yeah. if they're, we're going to be alive yeah. yet, have any kind of relationship with them. Yes, because we we're not taking uh, our situation seriously enough. Yes, I also have some friends who are part of the disclosure movement and. And I was speaking with one of them on the phone recently, uh, a, a big proponent of disclosure, and he thinks that it would be a wonderful thing. It would bring people joy. It would not affect the structure of our society. And I don't know that I agree with that. And I was wondering what your thoughts were. If, if these alien beings, if we are really and truly being visited by beings from other worlds, and they were to land here and interact with us openly, what do you say psychologically would be the, the, the consequences of that? I think the first thing we have to deal with is... Uh, there would be a very vocal and uh, significant segment of the human population that would think we've just got to get our our, uh, our guns up and shoot them all down because they're going to take advantage of us. And, and what we would be doing there would be projecting on the aliens uh, the image of us as we began to take over the uh, North American continent. We we wiped them all, we wiped out the uh, the people who were here already for the right. most part, right. and um, you know I think, and I think that people are so scared that uh, they will say, well this is now we're, this is really a crisis. We've got to get those people off the earth, and uh, I'm I that's what what we what we've been doing for the last um, I don't know how many millennia. Mm -hmm treating people who are somewhat like us but different as dangerous and people that we need to get rid of. So w what is going on there psychologically? That is a projection, right? It, well, yes, that is a projection. We have it in common with chimpanzees, for example, and we've overcome it to a great extent. You know, ch ch chimpanzees could not take a subway downtown to go to work. They can't stand to be that close to one another. And, and we're like that, too. We can't stand to be that close to others. and But we, we've we overcome that to a great extent so that we can cooperate with one another in ways that chimpanzees can't. So there will be a segment of the population that will respond that way. What else? What are some of the other responses we can expect? Well, some of the ones that we've already seen in the um, experiences of... Um, Whitley Strieber, for example, or in, and some of the other people that I, uh, whose experiences I describe in uh, Perils of the Soul, mm -hmm. there will be um, there will be people who want to learn from them and very naively want to learn from them, and uh, there will be people who want to be uh, close friends with them. And there will be people that uh, uh, just want them to go away. I mean, all all of the um, all of our humanity will be manifested there. We will, mm -hmm. will draw out everything in us, including the shadow, which is very, very um, problematic. So speak to us a little bit about the shadow. That is a big topic on this podcast, one that I like to cover as often as I can, because it is still not very well understood, I think, by the general public what Jung's concept of the shadow is. So would you tell us how that factors in here? Oh, well, um, if one says, if uh, someone says that the way I just did, uh, we, we have to take our shadow into consideration. It, our shadow is the part of ourselves that we don't trust, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And it may be, you know, one, there's a, um, it isn't necessarily a thoroughly evil 
Uh, I think that's a mistake to take two. I, uh, my favorite example is there when I was teaching at uh, Northeastern, uh, I lived in a, uh, an apartment building across the street from the, uh, the university. And um, on, uh, we shared our floor uh, with a, uh, a guy who was a drug dealer. And uh, he, he had a, uh, an area to cover uh, to supply with drugs that was about the same uh, shape as the area that my wife uh, employed as she was a, um, selling, uh, she was a salesperson selling um, uh, the kind of thing that you, uh, you know, software and, and so forth. Okay. Um, and she, she would one time said she would, um, she would be drawing, he draw, would be drawing into her parking space as he was coming back from a night of work and she was going out for a, a day, a day of work. Mm-hmm. And she said to him one day, you know, you could make a lot more money if you went straight. And he said, Oh, I could never do that. And you could just see here in the, in his voice, the horror of what it would mean to go straight mm-hmm. and become like all of those people in suits and ties. Um, so you can say, Going straight, what we call going straight, would in his case be uh, falling into his shadow. You know, it's the part, the part of himself that has not been developed, and he that he can't trust, and that he that he won't do well with um, in his everyday life mm-hmm. if the, if his shadow shows up too much. I don't know whether that's a, that's a very rough picture of the shadow but what i wanted to get in there was it it isn't necessarily tied to evil right uh, but the way he responded to oh i could never do that that was an implication that uh, just as uh, you and i not, might want to fall into the place in life where we would consider becoming um drug salesmen mm-hmm. um we would think that we that would be really a shadowy thing for us to do. We'd be giving in to something that we should be in charge of. And uh, so I don't know if it does a good job to describe a shadow that way, but uh, yes, it, it does. certainly does let yes. you know that uh, the shadow isn't all all dark. Yes. And so as a religious studies professor, I was wondering what your thoughts thoughts were about what this would do to religion, organized religion, if these these other worldly beings were to show up in physical form. Because that is another uh, big debate in the UFO community, is how this would affect our religions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, if... Uh, if, as Jung says, um, God is the uh, the name we give to the most powerful force in our psyche, mm. already we can draw the conclusion that God has a lot of different shapes, doesn't he? Mm. Because each of us may have a slightly different um, strongest force in our psyche. I would think that... Uh, um, the uh, the religions that we have now, um, the organized religions we have now, would probably not uh, agree that much with any religions coming from elsewhere, um, and so there would be uh, probably um, probably arguments going on between, and maybe even declarations of uh, what should be allowed and not be allowed in terms of in, encountering or having a relationship with these alien beings. Just everything else, everything that our earthly religions have have led to by way of controlling us would uh, be what we would expect them to do with regard to the, uh, the aliens, whatever spiritual practices and lives they had, might well be a, uh, a threat to these long-term rel- religions that we have, and there would be, therefore, an argument between them. Well, others would be trying to combine them. So it sounds like a lot of chaos would ensue. <laughs> Might be, yeah. yeah. I think probably would be a lot of chaos. Mm. 
But there would be signs all the way through it. And this is like just like the UFOs, the um, yeah, the visitors themselves. You know, they um, they have a lot to offer, but they scare they scare the hell out of us. Right. And uh, I think that's exactly what would happen. The re- our religious organizations would probably be spokespeople for um, developing a relationship with the aliens or staying as far away from the aliens as we possibly can. Human psychology. Yes. So another thing you bring up in the book is that our psyche has the ability to know things it shouldn't know. How is that? Hmm. I said that, eh? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what I meant, uh, no things we shouldn't know. Uh, where where would that come from? The shouldn't know part would be what I tried to discuss. Uh, I tried to mention a, a moment ago when I was talking about how the uh, aliens would be reacted to. Some of them, uh, uh, some of us humans would think we got to fa- learn more from these people. These people are our superiors, just as a uh, the uh, European um, um, colonization of the uh, the Third World uh, in over the century or so that's now behind us for the most part. Um, those primitive people wondered where the um, the colonists were getting all their power, mm-hmm. and they the colon the the colon the colonizers had things like radio and uh, and they thought well they they have the spiritual reality that they call radio um, and so they would put up uh, antennas uh, made of um, um, branch tree branches or something like that in order to live a life just at, like the colonists were living and so that they would the gods would do, would uh, be friendly to them and uh, they had a chance to um, uh, to survive the takeover of their land by uh, these Europeans. I think more what I had in mind was that you mentioned the integration of powers that we have always had but never learned to use. Mm-hmm. So that is something I think that the New Age movement was showing us but we we were calling them new but they were really ancient like we were talking about yeah, in the beginning yeah. right we we live and those of us in the west for the most part live in a world that is uh monophasic it, it only t- pays attention to one dimension of our brain and only the things that can be proven by logic or um, by chemical experiments are true. Um, and, uh, and we're fr- scared to death of altering our consciousness and seeing what the world looks like from an altered perspective. Mm-hmm. And, and so what we're, what we're dealing with in the world uh, right now is, uh, in some part, a, the more, we're more and more been listening lately to people who um, are familiar with altering their their psyches all, b- through um, activities such as dancing or um, drug taking. Uh, there's all sorts of ways in which we can uh, alter our consciousness and expose ourselves to a, a wider reality. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's sometimes classically, it's sometimes compared to uh, a radio dial. At every point along the radio dial corresponds to a uh, another another psych uh, another form of psyche another another use of psyche for whereby we can see reality in a new way. I don't know if I, that was an answer to your question or not. By the time I was done with it, well, yeah, it's very relevant because I was going to ask you about. Because on, on this podcast, I'm a huge proponent of undergoing Jungian analysis, because that's the route I took. And that's why I interview Jungian analysts. But so many people, <laughs> what I'm finding, what I have found, what I have experienced, and perhaps you have too, is they don't want to take the time to do that. 
because it's a long road. It's a, a long process. Uh, it moves quite slowly, but change, huge changes uh, occur at depth and that takes time. So somebody wants to take a drug trip or I don't know, undergo hypnosis or do quick and easy crisis well, management no, therapy. <laughs> right. So meditation. So what, what, what is happening here? Are we not facing ourselves by taking up with these, these practices and these techniques that are promising uh, a fast track to enlightenment or to what, what I think of as self-knowledge? Well, I, um, I'm not so sure it's a fast track. I mean, uh, if you, if you took, the uh, the aliens in uh, my book Perils of the Soul. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you looked at them and the relationships that they have had with the human beings that, uh, uh, in the best sense we could say, are, are are trying to be friends with them and trying to learn from them. Um, that is not necessarily going to be a quick journey to mm -hmm. to enlightenment. It's probably going to bring up all sorts of things that have to be digested mm -hmm. and um, and, integ and integrated into our overall view of what the world is and what what it is what it means to be human. So let's talk about hypnosis since I brought that up and I want to I know we're jumping around here but we only have about an hour so. You, you do mention hypnosis quite a bit in the book. And uh, as a Jungian analyst, would you share your thoughts on the effectiveness of that? And one of the things um, that happens in science has a history and uh, scientists are very frequently uh, prone to forget the history. Mm -hmm. And hypnosis is probably the best example of this. My doctoral dissertation, or no, the, I'm sorry, not the, uh, the, my dissertation at the Jung Institute in Zurich uh, dealt with uh, hypnosis because I was, I was working on the, uh, the, the French school, what Jung called his French school. And one of the, the so the, um, the psychologists back in those days, the end of the, uh, 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, we're discovering that uh, our psyches are can be divided against within themselves, and uh, we can have uh, aspects of ourselves that uh, are wiser than other parts, and uh, all this kind of uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so. Along, uh, what is ine inevitable is that someone points out that uh, the th the operative factor in hypnosis is suggestion, mm -hmm. and so that when uh, back in the '90s, when there was so much interest in the UFOs, and also in um, uh, satanic uh, religions right. and. Uh, um, that sort of thing. What we forgot was what they learned back in uh, around 1900, that hypnosis is a process of suggestion, and uh, the, uh, the hypnotist can give suggestions to the, uh, uh, the person who is being hypnotized in, in ways that encourage certain memories to come back. One of the things that the uh, people like um, John Mack would point out is that these you have to believe these people because they give you such an emotionally accurate picture of what has happened to them that they can't have made it up. This doesn't sound like something somebody made up. Mm -hmm. This sounds like something's been, somebody's been through something that was highly traumatic. And different from a dream? Um, well, yes and no, I don't, I don't know, but I, but the point, uh, the point of uh, my mentioning all that is by, uh, by the 1990s, they'd already forgotten what they were starting to learn in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Namely, that uh, hypnosis is a suggestive thing. They got to the point where they thought if they give a person a regressive hypnosis, it'll he will reconnect with experiences that he had back earlier in his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what comes out of that will be memories of what happened to him about that. And uh, what they didn't look at is that they could be um, so-called memories that are that are unconsciously manufactured right there in the hypnosis hypnotist's office because the person has been given a suggestion um, by some move that the the hypnotist made and didn't know he was doing um and there, thereby, what's, what is coming out of this whole process is something that's not reliable in a, um, a, a literal, factual sense. One of the most important, one of the most revealing things about that is that there were doctors who would say that uh, these, uh, a child who had, who had, was part of a, a case being made about sexual abuse and ch of children. Um, they would say have they would examine the hymen membrane in a, uh, a child mm -hmm. and say well, it, obviously this one was was subjected to uh, um, sexual experimentation because uh, her hymen is is torn. What they didn't know because they didn't study hymens is that most hymens are torn. They, it, it doesn't come only from having intercourse. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, they were, they were working with their assumptions. And uh, so you, when you get into this realm, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that you, a lot of mistakes you can make. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people who have undergone hypnotic regression or past life regression or have mm -hmm. been regressed to try to understand whether or not they've been abducted. And I've never undergone any of that uh, because of everything you just said. I don't feel it's reliable. I know the power of the unconscious. And I've been through analysis. And I do believe that if I did experience any of those things, they would have come out in some other way. My analyst would have recognized from either my dreams or in doing what she does would have seen the signs uh would you agree with that yeah more or less uh i it's very easy not to see the signs mm -hmm. um i don't want to be regressed or you know it's some sort of past life regression i mean i i could be making up anything right right and um, you, there may be, uh, there may have been dicey incidents um, with your parents when you were a child, which uh, you have remembered, mem remembered poorly, perhaps, as uh, times when, when they, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, were too uh, unforgiving or uh, I don't know what. And uh, so there could be there could be material like that that's in your past that you don't know about now, and you might find it by doing that, by by undergoing hypnosis. But you really have to be careful of whether this is uh, an, it's more most likely that this is a um, an adventure that has, your unconscious has made up for you right now in the hypnotist's office. And it's hard to keep it's hard to keep enough distance from it, I would think. There would be a reason for that, and that is why I am a big proponent in undergoing analysis. So I'd like to wrap up with the story of the woman who lived on the moon, and I think that this is a great example of how Jung took everything in the psyche seriously. And you open chapter nine, channels of alien wisdom with this story. And you say that it introduced Jung to one of the most important themes of his psychiatric career. And that now I don't know, do you think Dr. Heal, do you think that this is appropriate to talk about here? Or would you like to wrap up with something else? 
Oh, but I don't know. Uh, what do, I don't know what we have here. What, since we stumbled into this realm, uh, why don't we just stay on it? Because we, we've we been stumbling through this whole thing, <laughs> coming up with things that we hadn't planned to talk about. Right, for, right. And so, so on. yeah. So you said that he, he frequently told this woman's story when he was called upon to explain his unique approach to dealing with the mentally ill, and that she the woman who lived on the moon, taught Jung something so essential about the reality, richness, and vitality of an inner life that Mm. that Jung insisted that she really had lived on the moon and not just believed she had. And I bring this up because that is usually a distinction people make. Did it really happen or did this person just believe it it happened? And Jung said she really did live on the moon. And I was wondering if you would explain that to us. Well, there's a uh, a famous meeting between uh, Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz, probably his most popular um, s- student, um, in which uh, she was brought to uh, meet Jung um, of some promising students from the university were introduced to some uh, um, well-established uh, uh, scientists or workers in some field or other. And uh, she, so she came in and, and met Jung, and uh, Jung told the group uh, the story of the woman that lived on the moon. And von Franz immediately said, you mean she thought she lived on the moon? And he said, no, she lived on the moon. And so you you heard that's part of the story that he apparently he it seems as though in order to try to make people aware of what it's like to to deal seriously with the psyche is that you you have to take what the this woman lived on the moon in her in her life there was. There was nothing that suggested that this was um, a dream world that she went to at night. Mm -hmm. For her, this is where she lived all the time. And she had a heroic idea about what to do about it, which was that she was going to, uh, there there was a a rapist on the moon um, that uh, that was a, a different kind of being than we are. And as a result of the dangers of the rapist, all the women and children had to live beneath the surface of the moon. And she determined that she was going to free all the um, women and uh, children uh, by exposing herself to the... Uh, to the um, alien, I guess we could call him the alien. And um, so when he, he comes up to her, he's uh, he's she's got herself on a tower uh, as and where so she's exposed. He's going to fly up to her and uh, and she's going to stab him with a knife that she has hidden in her clothing. And uh, that will be the end of them and freedom will reign on the moon. And well, when he got here, there he was so beautiful that she couldn't ki- she couldn't kill him. And uh, Jung thought Jung knew that he, nobody had been told this story before. She's telling this story for the first time, and it's it's the reason why she, she can't live on Earth. She can't live on Earth because she really lives on the moon. But what, but what came out of it was that since she had revealed the story to a, an earthly person, Jung, uh, she had to begin to look, look at it anew. It's, it's as though and now all of a sudden it is possible to see the events that are happening on the moon as, like, as dreamlike experiences for her. So she, she's, Jung's technique in this thing was apparently simply to sit and listen to her, I think, uh, probably five days a week, Mm -hmm. and uh, listen to her for a good hour or maybe longer. And uh, in the beginning, she wouldn't say anything. But as time went on, she began to to, uh, talk a little bit, uh, reveal a little bit more every time, until finally she had revealed so much she couldn't go back to the moon. 
So uh, that was the story. That was the story that Jung gave there. It's, it, it was like trying to get her to realize that she lived on Earth, that she was an earthly being. Mm -hmm. And you say that the moon symbolized her emotional isolation, and and she eventually went on to live a quote unquote normal life. Yeah, that's right. And and but she also in the process. Um, informed Jung that she had had a uh, revolver in her purse every day that she went in for a session with Jung, and that if he let her down, she was prepared to kill him. Mm -hmm. So she was really, really taking this seriously. And he took and her seriously. I think the value of it for Jung, who was uh, wet behind the ears as an as a uh, as an uh, analyst or as a, a psychiatrist at this point in his life. He was only probably about 25 years old himself. Mm -hmm. And you say Jung learned more from her than he taught her. So mm -hmm. I'd like to end this with something about Jung. Uh, you said that he found himself on the brink of psychosis where imaginal realities threatened to overwhelm the more dreary facts of the fleshly world. He slept with a loaded gun in the drawer beside his bed, and he resolved to end his life if he could not succeed in his task. And that eventually he found a winged god of his own, Philemon, and built his life around what that god had taught him. I think it's a lot in common with the story of the, uh, the, the woman who lived on the moon. What you're talking about there are what Jung learned as he had those experiences in the Red Book, where pretty much every evening after dinner he would go up to his office and uh, and uh, enter the other world, the world of active imagination, and uh, and encounter beings of his own psyche. Yes, and he worked through it. He worked through it. So what would you like to leave us with as we wrap up this episode today, Dr. Huell? I don't know what I can say. Uh, <laughs> okay. Really. To tell, I mean, we've been, we've been everywhere here in this thing. <laughs> yes. but what, the, the theme that probably links it all together is we're trying to find out what is the significance of the psyche that we have? It takes us on adventures that are scary. And... Um, and sometimes we think we may never come back. And Jung certainly had that that uh, that belief. That's why he had that revolver uh, next to his bed. Uh, he he needed he needed to know he could escape if things got too hot. And I guess um, the reason that he was such a powerful analyst was he knew where the place where the parts were, the new territories were that people had to encounter. And so he was able to enable them to encounter them safely in his presence. Because he knew the, the collective uh, unconscious, the, the collective psyche so well that people could um, simply relax in his presence. And as many people who were uh, disciples of his and so on that were, who have been quoted in various books about people's experiences of, with Jung, um, People would say that uh, the, the world changed when they entered his office. It was as though everything became whizzing molecules. And uh, so they felt they were in an, in an alien land, and um, they didn't know what to do about it, but they knew they could trust him because he was familiar with that land. So anyway, Perils of the Soul is an attempt to touch on some of the fringes of what that land would be. Yes, and I see Jung as a guide to that new world. Thank you so much, Dr. Huell. Okay, my pleasure. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now on Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. 
So with special thanks to Fisher King Press, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Young 